hi. Uh, this video is called Making Sense of Strike and Dip. Um, what the heck is my Brunton even doing? So if you have never used a Brunton compass before, or if you've used one and you weren't actually sure what was going on, this is probably a good video for you because we're gonna go over why the Brunton works and why you would choose to use something like that and collect a measurement like a strike and dip. So first, what I wanna do is imagine a scenario where you might find yourself wanting to record information about the orientation of some rocks. We'll start in 2D actually. Okay, so let's say that you are driving along. This is a car. I'm just not a good car artist. Okay, let's say you're driving along in your car and you see a, a pretty cool outcrop, right? So it looks something like that. Here's a little tree for scale. So you're driving along, you see a really cool outcrop and you're like, I want to know about the orientation of those rocks. I want to be able to describe how these rocks are dipping and what they would look like in 3D space. Now it's not enough to record the angle that these rocks are dipping at because that might not be a good expression of the true way that these beds are dipping. Remember, rocks get laid down in layers. So just like a layer cake, if you were to peel off a layer, that's a surface. So we don't just wanna record a line, we wanna record that whole surface. So in 3D, that's where the information is that we really want. Okay, so let's treat this like a box. Those are the surfaces we care about. So let's say I pick this surface. Sorry about that. Let's say this is the, the top of some unit that we care about. And we wanna just learn about that one dipping surface, that one surface going in and out of, out of that rock unit. Okay, so now it's a plane. And you can describe planes in a few different ways, right? I'm gonna sketch another plane down here. Kind of face, more facing us. Um, we can describe planes by knowing one vector that's perpendicular to the plane, or we can describe them with two vectors that are in the plane, right? If we know any two vectors in the plane, we can describe the plane. You can think about this like having um, if you have two sticks, you could balance a little piece of paper or a piece of plywood on them. Okay, so we need two vectors. Well, vectors have direction and they have magnitude. We're just going to assume a length of one, a magnitude of one. So we're not really going to think about that. But we do need to think about direction because we wanna make sure that we're consistently uh, reporting whatever vectors we're reporting on uh, for these surfaces. So let's make it easy on ourselves. If we've got a plane that's dipping, okay, we'll go back to this one. Um, let's pick one that's horizontal, okay? If we pick a vector that's horizontal, then we can define its direction by being horizontal and in the plane. And then we need another vector. And obviously we need it to be in the plane, but all of these vectors, if we drew little lines are in the plane, right? And we need some way that we can consistently record this. So an easy one to pick is perpendicular to that first vector, but in the plane. So perpendicular to the first vector. So when we want to put these in geologic terms, this one becomes the strike and this one becomes the dip. So those are actually our two vectors that are defining a plane. And we do this, we make these choices for two reasons. One, it makes geologic sense. Okay, so we have geologic reasons. So for example, uh, let's say that you're out in the field 
you're collecting data on folds. Okay, well when you take the strike, if the fold is cylindrical, then you're approximating the fold axis. And when you take the dip of each of these, you're approximating the angle between the limbs or you're getting information about that. And there's a second reason for using a Brunton too, and that's functional. It actually relates to the form of the Brunton. So Bruntons are, I mean, they're not perfect boxes, right? But Bruntons have sides that are perpendicular to each other. And that means that you can use the structure of a Brunton to be certain about some of your measurements. Okay. So let's talk about what the Brunton is, is really doing. Okay. This is just a regular binder, like a binder you might use for class. Um, and I'm just gonna use it to approximate a plane. So if you're having trouble envisioning this um, online and in 2D, that's how my pencil's rolling, right? Coming down the page. So the first thing that you're gonna care about on your Brunton um, is strike. And to, to find strike, you're gonna use the bullseye level. And so this is my big fake plexiglass Brunton. And so what that bullseye level is actually doing um, is it is finding the line that is horizontal and contained in this plane. So I'm gonna rotate my plexiglass around. I can dip it up and down, side to side. And what it's doing is finding me that line. So right there, my bubble is in the middle of the bullseye and this binder is not perfectly made. Sorry for the interruption. This binder is not perfectly made, so it's not gonna go straight across with the rim of the binder. So what I'm gonna do is find the space again or the line where the bubble's in the middle, and then I'm gonna trace that line. So now, move you around a little bit. Oh, sorry. When that is horizontal, okay, you can see that's horizontal coming out, then the bubble is in the middle. Sorry, bubble's in the middle, and it's horizontal. Okay, so now we have one of those vectors. And if you've ever heard a professor, if you have used a Brunton before telling you, you have to hold your Brunton perpendicular to your strike, it's so that you get the right direction of dip. So in the field, what you would do is you would use the, the fact that the Brunton, the edge of it is at a right angle. You'd rotate this down and then you'd move your, your horizontal level, so this one, um, until the bubble's in the middle. We're gonna show what that looks like um, in a bigger picture. So I'm going to position this so that I am perpendicular to that line, okay? So this, this line that would be the intersection between the binder and the plexiglass, that's the other vector. But I need to be able to define the angle of that vector, so how much it's tilted. So what I'm gonna do with one hand um, is rotate something that is similar, this line level is similar to what you would be doing on your Breton until I run into the Velcro. <laughs> I'll do it on the other side, it's okay. Sorry guys. Just switch your hands. Okay, so again, I'm perpendicular. I'm gonna look down here. Keep my fake Brenton perpendicular. Okay, and now my bubble's in the middle. So if we're looking from the side, you can see that that level, that's horizontal, right? But it's not horizontal recording a dip of zero, it's horizontal recording this angle right here. Right there, that little bit. And that describes the change in this plane right here from from going right along 
um, the surface of the binder to horizontal. Okay, so that number, and here I did it on the opposite side, so it's um, there's the zero. It's about five degrees. Okay, so if the surface of this plane or of this uh, binder is what we're measuring, then those are our two vectors. This one is horizontal and in the plane. This one is perpendicular to this one and is dipping about five degrees and is also in the plane. So that's what your Brenton is giving you. It's giving you these two vectors that are helping you describe this plane. Um, and because every time uh, we're recording the, the same two, it allows us to make geologic comparisons. And again, that's, that's based on one, that it's geologically a useful measurement to take, but two, the actual structure of that Brenton, right? If a Brenton had a lip right here that was 45 degrees, then maybe every time we took a strike and dip, we would record those two measurements, and that would be the consistent measurements we take every time. But that's just not the form of a Brenton, so that's not what we do. All right, thanks, y'all.